I've been thinking about the passage of time, how much has transpired, how much is left. I am unmoored in this sea. There are things I left at home that will be waiting for me upon my return. Paris is an idol, an idealized but unsustainable episode of my life which will end in weeks. It is technically temporary, but Paris is what is anchoring me, keeping me from drifting away, and I cling to it as one clings to a raft. I have sought refuge in a pretty cafe, and I am the only one here. The barista is friendly and has somehow guessed that I am from California. He reveals with some wistfulness that he used to live in Northern California, and that he ran farms some years ago. I am guessing by the towns he mentioned and his vague air that he grew cannabis, which is legal there, but not here, I don't think. His friendliness cheers me up after this morning's episode that has me feeling out of sorts. Before the cafe, I had eagerly set off for Bibliothèque François Mitterrand, quite excited knowing it will be exceptional. Some of it is being remodeled, and the great reading room is set to close down June 18th for renovation, so I wanted to visit sooner rather than later. At the entrance to the courtyard are Greek statues of women with sheaves of papers and books. The foyer is pristine and white. There is even a chandelier, but I didn't notice it. All I saw were books beyond the glass doors and a great domed ceiling. I walk in through the sliding glass doors and wonder, but get shaken away when I hear someone yelling at me. The guard to the library and I do not understand each other very well. He was miffed because I did not ask to enter first. Although there is a sign that indicated I'm allowed to take photos and I was standing in the roped off area where the public is permitted to stand and view the room. It is very beautiful inside. The most beautiful of the libraries I have seen yet. But being yelled at and the hostility towards me as though I had been unforgivably rude stung me. I'm a little sensitive today, so I'm wallowing in this jarring moment. I feel better in the cafe though and resolve to do all the things I plan today.
After the cafe, I meandered a bit until I found the garden of the Palais Royal, and it is gorgeous. I scarfed down some chocolate and basked in the sun. Not at all ruining my lunch, I assure you. That is what cheered me up considerably. The squares of chocolate and dose of sunlight. And now this, this beautiful day, the sun came out. This is what I came for. This park has these funny little green metal chairs that face each other, and on the backs are quotes from famous and notable French, with a small sculpture in the middle representing what they're most known for. And on the backs of green benches underneath the manicured trees are mysterious quotes written in beautiful script. I think if I lived nearby, I would make a regular scavenger hunt of reading every painted or engraved saying so that I knew them all and where they resided. Park to go to my real lunch destination, but got derailed when I saw Le Grand Colbert, which rang a bell. But no, it couldn't be. And it was! The restaurant from the movie Something's Gotta Give. It looks just like it does in the movie. Globes of chandeliers, light fixtures, the black leather carchettes, the mirrors on the walls, and the large potted plants. So of course I changed plans and decided to have my lunch here instead. a glass of Lillet Blanc and here they put a cube of ice in the glass. Now I know how to serve it, how to have it. And the Lillet did the trick. I am magnanimous towards all. The slights, the rudeness, all gone away, banished to the ether. Now that I've indulged my sadness, back to being unbelievably happy and thankful for each moment here. Funny, really, how they put me by the door. Well, at least I have a vantage point of the gorgeous interiors. From where I'm sitting, I can see the table where the characters played by Jack Nicholson, Diane Keaton, and Keanu Reeves sat. I'm so silly. But of course I adore this movie. A writer being pursued by two men who goes to Paris for her birthday and a kitchen to die for. 
I still yearn for that airy white kitchen. And I still lust over the main character's life, the beautiful house by the sea, the career, the wealth and independence. Not so much the men, as the one she loves broke her heart. However, I never could figure out why she would have a problem choosing between Keanu Reeves and Jack Nicholson. Keanu would win every time for me. The restaurant is filling up. I'm always glad to eat at 12. Well, for one, I'm always starving by then. And for the other, I'm usually one of the first and the restaurant is mostly empty. Lots of French in here, hardly any tourists, so I chose doubly well. They have sat an elegant lady in white across from me. She is wearing a white dress, white shoes, with her hair done just so. And she reminds me a little of the actress Emma Thompson. I want to applaud her. A gold medallion belt, gold chain necklace. I wonder who she's waiting for. A lover? Her husband? A colleague? Does a woman wear white to a lunchtime assignation? The server waiting on the lady in white had the most amazing, almost Dali-esque mustache. The elderly couple next to me has ordered oysters on the half shell. Bravo! Although they do not seem to be ecstatic about it or about each other. I'm glad I ordered fish then. This restaurant must be renowned for it. The lady in white's assignation has arrived. They are a matching pair. He is wearing a cream linen suit and they are the very picture of an elegant older couple. I like a man who takes pride in his appearance. Her light blue leather purse perfectly matches his light blue shirt. They are moving in sync. He is leaning back with his arms stretched outwards and she is leaning towards him attentively. She was here first as well, waiting for him for at least 10 minutes. I divine that he has the power. There is some sort of liquor in this chocolate mousse, which is decadence itself. Well done, I dare say, well done. Not very sweet, but so rich, I imagine it is made of chocolate gold. So sinfully creamy. I'm not gonna lick the container, although I want to. I have returned to the garden and it is full of people. I just needed another hit of trees, flowers, and beauty. Maybe read a little, then figure out what to do with the rest of my afternoon. This is what it means to be rich, to have the time to do nothing if one so pleases. There are groups of school children out on a field trip, people taking their lunch, and an ice cream cart has taken up space by the round pond so there is hope this sunny afternoon will continue to be so. I finally found one of the funny chairs facing each other with poets, artists, writers engraved on the backs. I have a view of the square, manicured trees, the round green pond, the school children playing and people sunning themselves. It is a wonderful day to be alive. There is a bit of a wind, but even that is perfect. A slight rustle to the leaves on the trees, the flopping of a bird's wing as it alights nearby, the murmur of conversations. This is Parisian life, and I'm so happy I was here to see it. I 
spent a couple of hours in this lovely park, not wanting to budge, just soaking in the sun and reading Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell. I don't know if it will be stormy later, but it is lovely watching the clouds do their slow dance across the sky. For my second dessert, I indulged in more bookstores, only intending to browse. <sighs> Sigh. Until I went to Smith & Son on Rue de Rivoli and went a bit crazy. It is a very British bookstore, decorated for the Queen's Golden Jubilee, and so cozy with a little English tea shop upstairs. It comforted me tremendously, as though I had come home, even though I'm not even remotely British. It was just so very English and homey and calm. All the clerks were friendly. They had fake fireplaces and all the books from the UK. I could not resist and bought three new paperbacks. Such a delicious treat to buy oneself new books. Then I hurried home, struck with another familiar fancy, hoping the rain would hold off. I packed a picnic in the little basket in the apartment, coca van, tea, and berries and whipped cream. I also took my picnic blanket and one of the new books I purchased. So after packing my basket, I walked to the sun until I found this perfect picnic spot, praying for a perfect sunset, one that would be rainless with some sun for at least 45 minutes. It lasted for hours. I ate my delicious coca van and my berries, and the air was even slightly warm. I watched the sunset, the waters ripple like silk and the white clouds meander across the sky. What a delicious end to a day that started out a bit sad. I am now so very happy.